So, so it's time for me to introduce our speaker who is going to present on a subject that I really need when I'm studying French vocabulary because it's amazing. Give a big applause. Thanks for the intro. Um, all right, everything seems to be mostly in order except the I have slides. Can I get slides? I, I see them on the monitor but not on there yet. Can you see? Can you see slides? Okay, okay. Yeah, it's just like the talk name right now. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Anki, which you, some of you might know. It's a program which I use for re remembering all sorts of things, and I found it really useful for like geeking out about. Uh, about like like uh, making the spec spectrum of things that I'm interested in geeking out about much uh, bigger. So like uh, uh, here's a couple of things which I can do with Anki, which I found useful. So um, I went back like I went back to my university uh, education and I like went through a couple of these first year lessons where you learn like oh like 50 theorems about anal analytical geometry or something or. Uh, or let's say mathematical analysis, and now I can like remember the proofs for them. Uh, like I'm never going to again forget millimicron nanopicofem to atos yokto. Or you can remember 01189998819. Uh, Nine one, whatever. Um, yeah, you can. I, I can like recite my IBAN from memory. You can use it to memorize the uh, NATO phonetic alphabet. Uh, when I went to Switzerland, I used this to learn German from basically knowing nothing to being at like B1, B2 level in about a year. Um, I use it to memorize people's names. So if I have a picture of you somewhere online, I basically assume that I have uh, permission to put it into my Anki and to. Uh, like use that to remember your face and your name. Uh, I I use it to remember keyboard shortcuts. Remember, like when I read a paper, I use it to remember what the paper was about, what were the basic methods, um, like other random things. Like I'm not at all like a science person or like medical science person, but like I use it to memorize like a bit about the human body, like the names of like major brain regions. Um, so how Anki works. Uh, so Anki and spaced repetition in general works based on a thing called the spacing effect. Uh, basically, the spacing effect me, uh, is, uh, has been studied since the like beginning of the 19th, no, 20th century, uh, and it's, the, it's an effect where uh, if you if you have one hour of uh, time that you're willing to invest into learning something, then the thing that you absolutely do not want to do is spend that spend one whole hour. At, in one chunk learning the thing, because then like you're going to put a lot of information into your head and then you're going to forget it in two hours. Uh, so uh, turns out that uh, it's much better if you spend, say, like five minutes studying it at first. Then like you come back an hour later and you again study it for five minutes. Then you come again like two hours later, then you come a day later and so on. Uh, so that means that you can like invest this time into learning much more efficiently. And the reason this works is that uh, every time you're remembering the thing again, after a certain time has passed since you last recalled it, you have to think a little bit to remember it because like you don't have it immediately in your mind. And what you're doing there is like you know thinking for like maybe five, ten seconds, what is the thing, and then you're doing uh, active recall, and active recall is the thing which reinforces memories, which makes things go from short-term memory to longer-term memory. Uh, so spaced repetition is, a, the, is an algorithm, like in a very simple sense, which uses this, this spacing effect to let you learn things fast. And uh, the thing which you do is like super simple. You just uh, try to do something, that some kind of skill or recalling something that, you, that you're trying to learn. And 
uh, you just see whether you did it correctly. And if you did it correctly, you wait a bit longer until you try it again. If you didn't do it correctly, you do it again after a shorter interval. Basically, like it's uh, typically it's done like exponentially. So like next interval either like is multiplied by a constant or divided by a constant. Uh, so Anki is a open source tool uh, which uh, is used to to make these flashcards. So a flashcard is a thing where uh, you uh, you ha you have kind of a question, which for, in this case is like try to remember what is the integral of the logarithm of t dt, and uh, then you try to re remember the answer. You press show answer, and if you remembered it correctly, you then ra you then write like how easy or hard it was for you to remember. And uh, so this is just like a software implementation of this algorithm. Um, let's see. Uh, right. So uh, Anki has a lot of nice things. It's a multi-platform. It's also on Android. Uh, it has a synchronization server, which is not open source. But there are a couple of open source ones. There's syntax highlighting. There's lots of pre-made cards which for lots lots of subjects, especially people like medicine students who have to memorize a lot of stuff. They make a lot of cards. There's cards for every like major language. Uh, there are stacks that you can add on your notes, and uh, the the cards that you create in Anki are HTML plus JavaScript. So you can script them. You can make them potentially interactive. And also, it has an active developer community. Uh, there's a, here's a couple of examples of stuff that I uh, like to do with Anki. This is one. Add-on, where uh, this is an add-on which is useful for memorizing uh, things which you can represent as images. So this is this is the map of all these annoying tiny islands in the uh, Caribbean, and like and, and, and this is an SVG where there's uh, the name of the island and uh, you can like overlap these things over it, and then uh, the then then like the opposite side of the card shows you the actual name of the thing. And this is useful especially for like anatomy, like whatever can be represented as an image, or like this is like a some kind of n a neural network thingy. Um, it also supports LaTeX, so you can very very nicely do, uh, use it for mathematics, for like definitions, uh, theorems. Uh, also, I made a thing called permuted close, and I use it to memorize things which I confuse. So, for example, like uh, I used to not be able to remember like what type of radiation is alpha, beta, gamma, and uh, this is a card where every time you sh you see the card, it will randomly permute these rows. So, on every permutation, you will see a different order of them, and you have to remember which one is which. So, like under the under this, the, the answer that this asks for is like that gamma radiation consists of uh, of photons and beta consists of electrons or positrons and alpha consists of helium nuclei, or like I can use it to like memorize like which type of pasta is which, which is a very useful skill. Yes. Um, so uh, uh, I've heard a lot of people use uh, at least like trying Anki, but. Uh, some people have problems like actually putting it into practice, and there's there's a couple of tips which are good to follow. Uh, one of them is uh, one of them is using these closed deletions. Uh, a closed deletion uh, is a thing where you have some text and you remove a bit of the text and you ask to complete the middle. That's a very useful way to phrase these questions. Then. Uh, um, it's good to treat your collection as like a work of love, to like refactor it, to like go through it, make sure that like everything is phrased like the optimal way, uh, that like every card is asking for exactly one fact to recall and not like asking you to recall. Like you don't want to have a card where the front says Aristotle and the back says like 50 facts about Aristotle, because then if you see the word Aristotle, you not, you can't recall all the 50 things at once. You want to have like 50 cards for each individual thing. Um, it's also good when you're reviewing cards. It's good to notice where there are problems. Like if you're if you're noticing, oh, I always keep confusing these two words, uh, then it's good to notice that and like note it down in Anki and later go over it and try to fix it in some fashion. Um, then uh, right, I talked about redundancy, anatomicity, and uh, uh, Anki is really nice for like gamification purposes. Like it's a thing which I do in all of these this like death time when I'm like waiting in a queue, standing in public transit, or like sitting on the toilet. Uh, and that means that like over a day, if I have a bad day, I might review maybe like five cards. If I have a good day, if I'm like flying on an airplane, if I have like ten hours to spare, I will review maybe like a thousand even. Uh, here's a bunch of links. Um, all of these links are in my slides which uh, 
which are not linked here, but you can find them on the wiki. Uh, there's like a there's like a bunch of documentation, recommended plugins, um, and uh, that's the end of the content. And I can also show you a demo. Uh, how much time do we have? Enough. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is uh, my Anki setup. This is this is like uh, the main window, and. Uh, um, if I click on all, I, I just it, it contains e even like stuff that I don't want to necessarily show publicly, like like people that I know who probably wouldn't want their faces to be public. Uh, but like uh, here, uh, let's see if I can make this a bit bigger. Um, I'm gonna hope that you guys can see this. Like this is a card where it asks me uh, to overwrite working copies readme with the content of of the readme uh, on the master branch, and here's a command line saying git question mark source master readme md, and this is asking me to remember the word restore. So I, I press space and it shows me the correct answer, and then I uh, rate that I remember this like good. This was good. Then here I have a little bit of Python. Like this is asking me for like date time, the date of uh, 20 whatever, whatever. Like the constructor, date time, days today. Actually, yeah. Um, this is like this is the thing which I like learned about like earlier on this uh, camp that there is a term called a process window. That that's like a range of acceptable parameters for some process. Or like here I have some like random thing about stocks. Um, this is a thing where I'm, where I have, where I'm, where I'm like, you know the terms uh, meteorite, meteor, meteoroid, asteroid. Like these, these all are subtly different. And just like yesterday, I added a card where I decided I want to remember which one is which. Um, or like I use it to memorize also like country flags. This is Armenia. This is I think Latvia. Yeah. Um, or like. Capitals. Uh, this is Tirana. Um, this is Santiago. Uh, this is, I think, Venezuela. No, Col no Colombia. Uh, 2016. Uh, this is like Elias is for oh my ZSH. Uh, this is super useful, especially for like uh, getting better at using your computer, at using whatever tools you have, because often tools will have keyboard shortcuts, and uh, it's good to memorize them because then you're like way faster. Um, okay, I think I think that's about like all I can all all the interesting stuff that I can show. Shall we have questions? If if there are any questions, there are mics in the path in the middle. No, okay, then another big applause. So for the next speaker, I was a little confused at his subject because the title was How to Survive 100 Meters Underwater, and I was thinking about programming. But it's super cool. It's about scuba diving and how to survive it uh, and the technical aspects of it. So I can't wait to see what he's going to tell and give a big applause. Spinning ball of death, of course. So for the past few years, uh, uh, I've been uh, scuba diving quite a bit. Uh, a few years ago, I went on vacation to Thailand uh, because my manager said, OK, you really need to have uh, uh, some vacation. Uh, and I was working too much, and after I booked everything like a few weeks before, um, I thought, okay, what am I actually going to do there? Um, and yeah, I happened to go scuba diving, and I got addicted. Um, now, uh, just before COVID, I decided let's spend a lot of money and buy some technical diving gear. Because if you've ever scuba dived, uh, then you got your certification from PADI, SSI, or one of the other uh, certifications. And in that standard course, which is usually a few days, you learn, OK, don't go deeper than 30 meters, because that's uh, dangerous, uh, and you don't know how to deal with that, etc. So uh, everything beyond that is 
pretty much called technical diving, and that is what I've been doing for the past few years. Um, now, and it seems that uh, a lot of people that dive have some relation to IT, and I was talking to some people around here, and I was like, okay, I made a cool dive uh, uh, last March in Thailand. Um, I uh, uh, did a dive in a cave to 100 meter depth. Uh, it's called the Song Hong Cave. Um, these are some photos here uh, with uh, me uh, and the equipment uh, that I went down with. Uh, I'm not sure if you still see something, but okay. Um, so uh, what you see here uh, is what the bottles uh, that uh, or the tanks that I had on my back, and additional tanks that you need for decompression and such. So to be perfectly clear, right? I'm not a scuba instructor. I don't have the intention to ever becoming one uh, be, uh, because I don't really like uh, that part of the uh, diving, and it's too commercial for my uh, taste. Um, but don't try this at home. Uh, I assume that you don't have a 100 meter uh, uh, deep pool, but uh, seriously, uh, if you'd like to do this, very cool. I'd be happy to give some tips, but you do need your uh, training and uh, your certifications and such. Uh, plus, uh, if you do any certifications or theory around it, the first line is, okay, this is dangerous. You take a lot of risks. Know what you're uh, getting yourself into. Now, um, this is a, a, a log, what you can see, uh, uh, where I did the dive. Um, so I'm not sure if you can read the details, but it took me about 25 minutes to go down, uh, because in a cave, uh, in that case, you don't go straight down, because there's actually rock beneath you. Um, and it took me about 25 minutes to get to 100 meter. Now, I could spend a very long time there, two minutes, uh, and then I had to go back up. So I, uh, it took me 25 minutes to go down to 100 meter. I spent there two minutes looking at uh, uh, people that put all their tags on the line, uh, like uh, showing, hey, I've been here. And then we went back up. And I had uh, over 90 minutes of decompression. Now, if you're not familiar with scuba diving and what the hell decompression is, so if you do these deep dives, you, uh, uh, you breathe air, and if you breathe air here, uh, we breathe about 21% oxygen and 79% uh, nitrogen, and some other little gases, but uh, that's about it. If you go underwater, the pressure increases, and the molecules get closer to each other, and you basically uh, uh, breathe more of that same gas. Now, uh, with oxygen, that is not necessarily a problem because uh, your body takes care of it, and uh, that's fine. Uh, the problem here is uh, with nitrogen, or uh, if you go very deeper, you add some helium. Uh, that gets into your tissues, and um, uh, under heavy pressure, that's uh, kind of okay. But if you go back up, it expands. Now, uh, what you want to prevent there is that uh, um, there uh, will become bubbles in your tissues uh, because those bubbles can get uh, in uh, between nerves and uh, in your back, in your spine. Uh, you can get paralyzed or you can even die uh, in the worst case scenario. Now, the other problem is what kind of gases do you actually breathe? So I made a list of uh, how it would look like if I would go down with uh, the same uh, mixture of gases that we breathe here. Now, uh, you have something called a partial pressure, and uh, together you see that is 100%. Um, so uh, that doubles, uh, or uh, at 10 meters, that doubles and then increases at same steps every 10 meters. Now, there are two problems here. Um, one is, at some point, you get narcotic, um, uh, and that is uh, because of the nitrogen. Uh, and uh, that gives you a happy feeling, uh, maybe even stoned, which is cool, but not so cool if you're 100 meters underwater and you don't know what to do anymore. Um, so what you do to prevent that is that you replace part of the uh, nitrogen by helium, which is a lighter gas and doesn't cause uh, uh, those same effects. It does have other uh, effects, such as uh, a very high uh, voice, uh, which is kind of cool, but uh, it ha has benefits for that as well. 
The downside of helium is that it's crazy expensive. So if you are like, okay, I want to do that technical diving, make sure you bring a fat wallet because it's very expensive. Um, uh, to uh, give you some insight for these dives that I made in Thailand were three deep dives. It costed me about a thousand euros of gases alone. So, uh, and that's apart from everything else. Now, the other problem is uh, uh, the oxygen. At some point, oxygen gets poisonous. And uh, we typically indicate that on the partial pressure of the oxygen. And um, in diving, in general, the partial pressure of 1.4, uh, that is the limit that you go to. Uh, or uh, that you can have. And that means that at 1.4, um, uh, you don't uh, get convulsions yet. But anything higher, if you have a high workload, so if you're swimming, if you're doing stuff, uh, it could happen. Um, and uh, getting convulsions here and dropping on the floor, kind of okay, uh, we can handle that. If you black out underwater and you stop breathing or whatever, mm -mm, yeah, that's not so cool anymore. So um, what you do uh, for these deep dives is that you actually decrease the, uh, the oxygen. Because uh, what you do is, um, uh, say, on these deep dives, what I did, uh, I had 13% of oxygen. And that means that I can't breathe with the air. Uh, yeah, you can take one or two breaths, but at some point you will pass out. Uh, you won't die immediately, but uh, that also means that uh, you can only breathe it uh, when the PO2 gets high enough for your brain and oxi uh, the oxygen to be processed. So, um, yeah, um, uh, that means that you have to carefully uh, plan everything uh, when you're going down on uh, such, a, um, uh, such a trip. Now, there are great tools for uh, doing that. Um, uh, Subsurface is one of them. Uh, it's an open source tool. It was uh, originally uh, designed, uh, designed by Linus Tovalt, who also was a, uh, or is a scuba diver. Um, but um, yeah, so what I did here, I made a, a quick example how I would plan a dive to uh, 100 meter. So, um, what you are seeing here is that I'm uh, having a double 12, as they call it, which means there are two tanks on your back, 12 liter, and I have three additional tanks with uh, uh, decompression gases, uh, because uh, you want, on your way back, all that gas is still in your tissues, you want to increase the oxygen uh, at a, a proper depth to make sure that you breathe less of the inert gases like helium and uh, nitrogen and to make sure that it goes out of your tissues and then at some point you can surface. Um, yeah, uh, so um, what you see here, uh, for example, if uh, uh, people can read it, is that uh, I go down uh, on my 50% oxygen. Now, I do that for the reason is that on the surface, I cannot actually breathe the uh, mix that I had in my back tanks. I only have 13% of oxygen. So at some point, I switch to what I have on my gas, and then I can go deeper. Um, now, at that point, I am at 100 meters, and uh, then I can go up. Now, how do I decide when I want to go back up? So, if you are diving in caves or doing deep technical dives, there's the golden rule of the one-third of gas. So the idea is that in your planning, you always assume that you want to surface with one-third of your gas. Because if something goes wrong, uh, that means that you still have sufficient gas left uh, to uh, come back to the surface. So uh, for in your entire planning, you uh, basically do that. Um, now, there's uh, one other uh, switch that you see a bit later on when I go up. Uh, that is actually also uh, with helium combined. Um, and there's something called isobaric counter diffusion. Uh, I have no idea who came up with that term. But um, if you switch very uh, quickly to a, uh, between helium and uh, nitrogen, uh, there could be side effects. Uh, you can get dizzy and whatnot. And what I said earlier, if you get dizzy here, that's all OK. Um, uh, being that underwater, not such a good idea. 
What you see in the rest of the planning, at some point I go to 50%, that's typically at 21 meters depth. And uh, then at six meters depth, you switch to 100% oxygen, which means that uh, at that six meters, you are at uh, PO2 uh, of 1.6. And you might think uh, earlier, didn't you say like, okay, um, you have a maximum of 1.4. That is correct, but the exception is for decompression, where the assumption is you are pre pretty much still in the water. So you don't have much activity, no high workload. Um, and as you can see, after much time of being still in the water, uh, you can finally surface. So, yeah. Uh, pretty much that is how you could survive, uh, but as I said at the beginning, a lot of planning, training, exercise comes into that. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much it. So, um, of obviously you can ask questions, but I had a question as well. So, how long does a dive like this typically take? So uh, that depends on the uh, decompression, but in this case, uh, the one that I did was um, just over two, two and a half hours. Wow, okay, that's amazing. Uh, are there any other people who have any questions? No? Okay, well, again, a big applause. <laughs> the next speaker, uh, he introduced himself and I asked what he was going to talk about and he said mosaic and I was like, wow, that's amazing. Stones, that's something, I'm not a programmer, I can understand and it was software. But that actually made me more excited because now I can learn about something I had no idea about. So I'm here to introduce you to Pepijn and he's going to tell you about mosaic. I borrowed Thomas' laptop, and I'm not sure how to plug it in. <laughs> uh, it's uh, I don't know. It's his laptop, the guy with the beard there. It's. Uh, <laughs> I can use any 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 random laptop that has a web browser, but. Uh, I need to press harder? Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, it so, it's, it's doing something. But it, it, it changed the screen resolution, so it detected it at least. Yeah, but somehow it didn't do the one thing. No. <laughs> Does anyone have a laptop with HDMI that they can borrow? <laughs> a laptop with HDMI. I kind of wanted to show the thing. Like, I, I can use any laptop, any laptop with like a web browser and HDMI. Um, I mean, I, mean you c I can just tell about it, but it's kind of boring. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Maybe. Test. Oh, uh, there's someone. No. It's micro no. HDMI. <laughs> okay, so there are a couple people solving maybe, the issue. Maybe, maybe that? That's a great idea. So. Um, we're going to swap around some things. Um, so the next speaker, let's see, is um, Richard, and he is going to tell about a subject I think is so cool. It's called a Furby. Who here has heard of a Furby? Whew, me too. I had one when I was uh, when I was a little bit smaller, and then my little brother dropped it. 
of the stairs, so it broke down. But my dad, he actually opened it up, so he took all the skin off and looked at the mechanics. For him, it was cool for me, nightmare material. But um, Richard here is going to tell you a lot about his Furby and all the cool things that it can do. So give a big applause for Richard. I don't have a mic, but I'm going to talk about Furby, and I have to improvise too because there's a quick change in speaker slides. Can you hold the mic? <laughs> okay. And do we have a stage for my co-speaker, uh, Furby? Um, you, can you grab a chair for me? Thank you. Okay. And I'm going to share a presentation. And um, so actually, I'm going to talk a bit about what I'm doing here. Uh, I'm talking about uh, Furby. Uh, oops, is my screen sharing? There it is. Yeah. OK, cool. So I have Furby here. And I'm going to put him on the chair because he's very important. Oh, that doesn't work. All right. Um, I'm afraid if you can't see it that well, if, it, if, it, if they do demo, we'll figure it out later. So I'm talking about Furby. Furby is an IT tool that uh, can talk and speak. Um, you might remember it, but I'm going to upgrade it. Um, why does it not click? OK. So we have the old school Furby. The old school Furby had very limited commands. It just had a few commands. It could say a few words. It could do a few movements. It's very basic. There have been newer Furbies since the 90s. Uh, but I really like this one because this is the one I used to have. Um, and I'm trying to upgrade it with a bit more intelligence. So the goal is that I'm going to have a real live pet. It can talk, it can walk, it can maybe sing for me, and I can talk to it. It will talk back. It can control the house. Um, it can have expressions, because it already has a motor in there for doing that. Um, but the problem is it also has to be fully private, so I can run it at my home without exposing any data to the cloud or to Google or to the Amazon people. Um, so I'm going to talk about how the Furby works. So there's a really nice patent that's online. It will show you all the details on how the internal components are, which help me to create this presentation. Um, in the Furby, we have a speaker. We have fur, and I'm going to talk about the details here. In here, in the Furby, there will be a motor that has a worm wheel that drives a little cog that controls all the components with one motor. So the eyes, the ears, the mouth, it's all connected to one engine. Um, so I'm going to see how I can make this all work. I'm going to put a Raspberry Pi in there. It's DOW works pretty well. It fits inside. It has powerful enough to run a Docker container. And then we can maybe use it to use it as a wake word trigger or relay speech to text to another server. Um, if you want to see these components, I left this them here. I also have it all on GitHub. Um, so to make space for the Raspberry Pi, I removed uh, a little piece on the bottom. So it, it, I cut it off with a cell um, very gently. And now it fits really well with Raspberry Pi and uh, a speaker hat. So now it can do some dancing. So Yeah, so <laughs> there's some music, and I wanted to share the music. So it's now dancing, but this is one motor. The motor is continuously spinning, which is beautiful, and it looks cool. but. I really want to have control of one single expression. I want to say eyes open, mouth closed, eye, ears up, ears down. So to do this, um, there. So we have a positioning of components inside the Furby. In the Furby, there's a wheel. The wheel is what I'm talking about earlier. It's driven by the motor. It has a little wheel that is connected to a, a slide. And the position of the hook from the eyes is in one slide. Then there's another wheel for another gear, another part. And the pin will slide through the wheel. And the position of the wheel will tell how the eyes will look. To do this, we have a little wheel here. This wheel turns. There's a little gap in the wheel. And when we have a light sensor in here, 
is positioned right here on the bottom. There's a light, and then there's a sensor. The wheel turns, and then there's a gap in the wheel right there that every time the light is shining through the wheel, we can count it as a, a pulse. And by this, we can very accurately position all the, the engine parts and all the, the expressions and, and body parts with this one wheel. So these are all the settings that I have. But to demonstrate it, I brought my Furby. But I think I'm going to do a video here. I'm going to start here by doing the calibration sequence. I'm turning the wheel full clock cycle to know when it hits the button, because every time the wheel makes one full turn, it presses a button. Now it says calibrate it. The Furby is now ready to go. So it starts at like, I press it down, ears up, ears down. Um, so I'm still trying to make a combination of the expressions in here. And I can say, OK, um, I want you now to sing a happy song for me. And it will go do that expression. Or it will look disappointed at me, or it will be bored. Um, so now demonstrating every sequence of this wheel. Um, so it's going. Uh, as you can see, I can really have full control of where it stops and where it goes. Um, yeah, it's, it's really happy to see it. Now, the Furby clock works as follows. If the eyes are, uh, let's say, open and ears are high, and I want to go to here, I first have to go through all these steps. But I can probably toggle somewhere with an expression here in between, or an expression in between here. Um, this way, I can really make an expression as a complete set. But like I said before, the whole thing should be private. So there's implementations of Alexa that you can install on your Pi. And you can relay your whole house to Alexa. But this is too easy, and I don't want to do that. So I use Raspi, which is an open source Alexa program. You can configure it and run it on the Purby, connect it to MQTT. We do the same thing on the biggest server I have at the home. We have a PDP 11. And we connect it to Home Assistant. And then you can relay the MQTT commands to Home Assistant, and then control the U-lights. And then the U-lights consecutively, when you, for instance, walk into a room, the motion sensor triggers. It sends an MQTT event. Then the MQTT event will publish a REST call to the Furby to make an expression and to also do some text to speech. So um, this is how that works. I need to get some breath. OK. Um, with Raspi, you can do custom wake word detection. That means that if I now say, hey, Furby, it will tell me hi back. So. Hey, Furby. I don't know if you heard that, but Furby was singing yeah, da, 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 when I said, hey, Furby. So with Raspi, you can make your own wake word setup. Um, there's probably a tool that's not part of Raspi to do that. Um, but it's, it's really nice to set it up. Um, cool. Now, to configure Raspi, we have a few sentences. It's like, what time is it? Or tell me with the time. You write the sentences down. This sentence then triggers an MQTT event that goes to Home Assistant. Um, and then it also triggers the Furby to have a kind of like nice effect. So this is Home Assistant. If you don't have a Furby, it's still pretty cool to set it up. Uh, you can easily integrate it with everything in your house. It's open source. You can make shell scripts. You can put it all in a Git repository. You can easily deploy it and manage it. It's a really nice tool to play around with on the weekend. So the whole project is still work in progress. Um, so I showed you now that I have gained full control on how the Furby looks. But I want to make this into a sequence of events that can combine to make an expression. Um, so with this expression, I can make a REST call and then connect the REST server to the MQTT server. Um, and of course, uh, we have the Furby here, but there's still plenty of room for a camera. So I can also add face recognition and image recognition and then make it like a real animal that 
we'll be happy to see you, of course. <laughs> um, the whole project uh, kind of works now quite predictably. So it's not as nice as a cat. The cat will greet you or not. Maybe it will not greet you. The dog will or not. <laughs> so for me, this is like quite boring. So it's only magic if you understand that somebody said this to somebody yesterday. I thought it was quite funny. Um, so I want to add some randomness or some unpredictable or some intelligence that will be like surprising or nice to see. So it will become magic and like real pet. Um, it is online. It is on GitHub. Uh, so you can look at the source. It's still very basic right now. So I still want to put all the slides that I made today because the whole idea came up yesterday. And I need to like document it so like when you look through the code, you can still like look at all the references and make sense of it. Uh, that's my email address. And if you have other ideas, please come talk to me. And I'd love to add more to this project or share it with you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Richard. That was amazing. I learned so much. If anyone has any questions, again, there are mics in the middle, or you could email or, well, just ask. Cool. So uh, thank you. Thank you. And then for the next speaker. Uh, you wanted to share your slides um, on here, right? OK. I have to show. Where is it? Um, so are you going to go last? OK, so uh, a little bit of change of plans. Just to let you know, there are two more talks. So in the program, there was only one. But now there are going to be two more talks. Uh, you can go last, if that's OK with you. Does it work? Is it? Oh, sorry, I have to change my keyboard layout. There we go. So our next talk I already introduced. It's about Mosaic, and now the laptop works, which is amazing. Um, and he's going to talk about, like I said, Mosaic. So another. Applause, and then he can start. Can I like do it full screen? Uh, the website? Yeah. Yeah, sure. And then um, you want to look at README? No, I uh, just uh, the website here. Oh. Donk. Okay. Um, let's give another try. Uh, I'm Pepijn, and. Um, yeah, I'm originally a software developer, and then I studied electrical engineering and IC design. And then I figured that actually the software that IC designers use is kind of not so great. Uh, so I decided to uh, write open source software for IC designers. Um, so this project is basically that. It's a schematic editor for IC design. You can also use it for like, simulating other stuff. So it's like basically a spy simulator interface. Um, and I will talk a bit about it, but also what I want to do, I, I see a few people with laptops. One nice thing about this, or like different thing about this app is that it's online and collaborative. So if people with laptops in their laps um, will go to Niancad with a D at the end, dot github.io slash mosaic, uh, and then you can go to try online. We can actually edit the same schematic, and I will be able to see, hopefully, what people in the audience are drawing, which will be, I think, a funny experiment. Um, this is the main, uh, yeah, so this is the entry point of the application where you sort of manage your libraries and your models and your stuff. Uh, you see the little spinny thing in the corner, it means it's like download, downloading. Uh, the database now because it's by default it's, uh, it talks to a, a CouchDB database in the cloud. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it will synchronize uh, your schematics there. But you can also use it offline. It's like an offline first application. So uh, if you like go in workspace properties and remove the synchronization URL, you have a purely offline application. You can also run your own CouchDB or whatever. Um, and can I go to the previous tab while it's loading? Um, oh. <laughs> okay, uh, I will just add an interface and see what happens. So let's design a filter. 
or something. And add a schematic. I mean, name it MCH filter. And now if I, like, in theory, this should eventually show up on uh, your version of the thing if you have a laptop in your lap. And if you double click it, you can open the editor. Um, yeah, this is the main editor. Um, it's designed to be like very easy, easy to use, but also quite powerful. So you can like, like everything has like you know mouse buttons that should be obvious, but you can also hide all the stuff and use key, keyboard shortcuts for everything. So I can like press R and then we'll place a resistor. Oh, it looks kind of a bit broken. Maybe the CSS is a bit not loaded. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, hello. Help. <laughs> How do I get back to? Like I'm. No, but that, like I, I did this like where it zoomed out of the window. And I'm not sure why. How I can get back into the. <laughs> this is like an Apple thing. I'm just not like. Also, because they had to talk to Furby. Ah, okay. You're on your no, no, different network. Okay. It's not a bit more um, maybe, maybe it's now completely broken. <laughs> um, anyway, let's delete this one and place a voltage source and draw some wires and some more wires. Uh. Okay, it's quite <laughs> difficult to do with one hand. Um, yeah, so that's uh, the basic idea. Uh, it seems to, oh, and I'm scared to press escape now because when I pressed escape previously, it did something weird. Anyway, um, so next thing I can show, like I assume nobody has made it to this place yet, because I don't see anyone else edit showing up. Um, what I can try now is to run actually a simulation in the cloud. So what normally what you would do is you can install this. Like, so, it's, so now it's running purely as a web application. But of course, if you want to run a simulation, you need to run some simulation somewhere. Um, there's also a desktop installation, which is based on JupyterLab. Um, but there's also... Um, this thing called MyBinder, which allows you to like turn a Docker repository or like a GitHub repository into a Docker image and then run it into the cloud. Um, so I mean, demo effect. This will not, probably not work, but it's technically should be. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Good luck. Um, it should be possible to just, like launch instantly into a cloud environment where you can just like run a spy simulator that's open source uh, to simulate your thing. Uh, but obviously not today. So, uh, I mean, yeah, that's, uh, I'm not sure what else I want to show. Um, you can manage libraries, draw schematics, simulate them. But yeah, that basically what I wanted to say is that like a, a, an easy to use interface for like, you know, clickety click, just draw a schematic and run basic simulations. There's also like a, a notebook interface where you can like write Python code to run simulations for more advanced automation. Um, and yeah, uh, well here you can see a bit of the simulation interface, but uh, it's a bit uh, small, and of course nothing works. But anyway, I just wanted to show this, and uh, if you're interested, you can play around or ask me about it or whatever. That's all I have, I guess. Too bad that there are so many Wi-Fi issues. Mine has been overloaded all day. It's like you try to load one Wikipedia page and the thing has a seizure. I can say that because I have epilepsy. Um, if there are any questions, again, mics are in the middle, but I think they can also just approach you. Yeah. And um, don't be afraid to check it out. I think you could just play around with it. And uh, Yeah, it's on GitHub. It's like, uh, 
nyancat.github.io so, slash mosaic. And you okay, can check it out. so if I want to try this out, what should I Google? Or? Nyancat mosaic. Okay, well, thank you so much. Then our next speaker is going to speak about a subject that I, as the younger generation, although it's maybe bad, bad to say that, are going to have a lot of problems with, which is climate change. But not only are we going to have problems with it in the future, we are already experiencing so many issues. So the next talk is going to be about how we should take action now. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, thank you. My name is MDB. Um, I also in my dreams, so I was calling myself Daya, or Daya in English with five letters. Um, and formerly I dreamed about um, dreaming together with other people. I dreamed about the World Trade Center as well, like driving one two-seater into the World Trade Center and others co-dreamed this into a big airplane and that was a mess in my dreams. So. Okay, I also dreamed about climate catastrophes happening, uh, which are already happening now. And I did refuse to think about or imagine what could go worse in the, in the sense that, in, in, the, in the hope that with knowing what is coming towards us, told by scientists, the people, especially the people in power, would change their courses, the course of humanity, to the better and avoid such things. Um, but it's all rigged. We have a money system, monetary system that is driving even more money to money and money and totally forgetting about the environment. Um, everyone can rethink about 2021, and I think everyone has memories of catastrophes happening globally at least twice a week, and this was not the case years ago or decades ago. Um, we are now having temperatures rising very much, more and more, and net zero and stay of CO2 in the air, in the, in the atmosphere, is based on sinks available, like Amazon forest, like um, the Great Barrier Reef around, all around the continent of Australia, and also the plankton in the, mere, uh, in the top layers of the seas of the oceans. Um, we all know Amazon uh, forest has been reduced very much the, um, the, 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 the reefs have been, are dying and are mostly dead, meanwhile. And by diffusion of CO2 into the top, top layers of the oceans, in the top um, sea surface, that surface where the plankton is living is becoming a bubble water um, with um, high H2CO3, with an acid, with, with acid, becoming more and more acidic, and this will lead to the plankton dying as well. So the sinks for the CO2 in the atmosphere are partially gone, and some of them are going right now. And the CO2 that is now uh, 421 micro parts, right, 421 ppm, um, will even raise, some of it is not yet in the upper layers of the atmosphere where it's doing the worst um, effects, heating up our planet. And so what we have now, like in 2021, will be our future for at least 20 years. Same as 2021, at least 20 years, and with inaction and letting our rulers um, proceed to um, ruin everything. <laughs> Sorry. This will be had so worse. I mean, I can imagine 
the floors in Brandenburg around Berlin are getting deserts. This means the soil has um, e e um, e um, yes, um, is the, the earth is gone and it's mostly sand left over in Brandenburg around Berlin, where the big droughts for the last few years have been. And I imagine like we will have lots of um, winds, not only heat points like now, still winds, but also have heavy winds because these uh, temperature differences need to be um, ausgeglichen, um, sorry, equalized, right? Uh, they, they equalize each other and so the winds will get stronger. Also with higher temperatures, I was told that every degree Celsius gives the air 7% more storage of water capacity. Um, so there will be stronger and heavier wind, so to say. It's probably hard to understand, but winds will get stronger and we will have, like in five years, we will have probably, with inaction, at least with inaction, we will have every day at least one tornado in every country in Europe. And it can be typhoons or tornadoes. And as the soil is mostly sand, there will be lots of sand. So we get sandstorms. And this is terrific, not only for the living beings, but also for the solar panels that are heavily damaged by sandstorms. And of course, it's not good for wind turbines as well. So we will have lots and lots of trouble, which is not being seen by our rulers. Our rulers are ignoring the IPCC um, um, assessment report, six currently, which is, with the management report, very, very bad, despite the fact that there is filtering from the science, single scientist at the bottom that has to take care of what he's saying to the public for, third, um, for, for his external payments still coming in and him not losing jobs. For example, Germany, the most scientists have only limited for two years working uh, agreements. So they are very much in danger of not being employed anymore if they lose their third um, external money sources. Um, so they have to take care that they are not free to speech, free to speak freely what they found out and what they think will happen and how it will be. In the second level of the IPCC, there's the group, same thing happening again, then the area of subject or area of um, region, uh, same thing happening again. And in the fourth level, there's the management report, which is talked with lobbies and governments, and every word is gone through and checked against if that is maybe not what the governments really want to hear, the public to hear. So, and still, if you look at these pages, it's about 200 to 300 pages uh, with different parts of the management summary. If you go through this, you will see it's very, very bad to know this. And <laughs> I, I, I'm, I, I make a bet. <laughs> Chancellor, um, our German Chancellor did not read it. He did not order anyone to read it, and he has no one that has read it and telling him how bad it is. Even with government intervention and lobby intervention and everything I told you right now, which is just logically. I cannot prove it, but you, everyone knows how it is. It's the world we live in, and it's rigged. Maybe, maybe, maybe it would help to remove money globally, but this is one thing that cannot be done by single persons or whatever. So, and, and I think this will not be done by our rulers at all. But it would help a lot if you imagine um, a society for requirements, so everyone gets food, water, or drinks, whatever. Um, shelter, um, and from time to time some fun, of course, not to spare it out, and everyone needs the stuff 
he needs to do his work. Because we can't live with an exchange um, trade system, because this would not allow specialists to continue the work. And we need specialists, for example, for plutonium to keep. We cannot keep this with hands. We need technology. We need to continue using, be able to use technology to contain the plutonium we have. 3,700 tons, 1.3 million kilograms, and one kilogram or five kilograms doesn't matter really equally distributed about the surface of the Earth would be enough to kill all life. And these 1,300 tons, 30 million kilograms, 13 gigagrams um, of plutonium um, are mostly of that isotope that has 24,000 years half time, which means we have to keep it for another 430,000 years safe to get back to uh, an amount that is not really that harmful, in theory. In practice, we have lots of um, pollutions via um, Wiederaufarbeitungsanlagen, uh, we manufacturing uh, like um, Le Le was Le no, not Le Haft, um, um, okay, Wiederaufarbeitungsanlagen, um, again, um, and also by um, accidents like Chernobyl or um, in Japan, uh, which and lost bombs, of course, lost uh, nuclear nuclear bombs, nuclear warheads. Um, so we already have a kind of pollution that has to be removed sooner or later. And after the climate crisis, if we manage to go through this as a society, as a working society, as a fully um, capable society. Next thing, I think, will be to collect the plutonium back from the Earth to contain it and to treat it in a manner that has yet has to be invented. Thank you very much. Well, thank you on a talk that is a subject I personally find very important. Now again, there are mics at the path, so if anyone has any Sorry. questions, please ask them, and I think you'll be approachable for questions afterwards as well. Yes, sure. Yes. So um, that were the lightning talks for today. A big applause for everyone who spoke, who helped organize them, and yourself for listening to all of them.